Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of The Master Magician by Charlie N. Holmberg. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications, so you'll be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support BBC, you can do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. One, you can become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So without further ado, let us continue. The Master Magician, Chapter 14 Sienny had no giant paper gliders at her disposal and didn't want to involve Bennett any further in her dark-rooted hobby, so she set to work on getting to Aylesbury herself work that would let her get out of Ellsbury quickly, without needing to find an untarnished mirror. She recalled the spell being in the Apprentice's Reference Guide to Sipping, a book that was now long overdue from the Mon Library. Though this trip to Magician Bailey's estate had been focused on folding, Sienny had not possessed the heart to leave behind all her references and supplies for the other materials' magics. In fact, she brought about two-thirds of them with her, all crammed into the bottom of her suitcase. After scrolling through the table of contents, Sienny flipped to page 84, the header of which read, Speedy Footwork, under the chapter title, Travel. She reviewed the spell carefully. She'd never performed it before, and if she botched it, she'd have to travel through mirrors, assuming she could find a good one in Ellsbury which would take time. She counted out her round rubber buttons and came up too short for her shoe size, which meant she had to borrow two from Fennel's paws. Using a sipping lancet, the only sipping tool she owned, Sienny carved the buttons with a meticulous hand. A half circle here, a slit there. Mistakes forced her to borrow two more of Fennel's rubber paw pads, Finally, she laid the buttons out on the floor in a specific zigzag pattern shown in the book. Five for each shoe. Then she placed her most comfortable shoes over them and commanded them, Merge. The rubber made a sucking noise as it adhered to the soles of her shoes. Crossing her fingers, Sienny slit the shoes on and said, Quicken, times two. She took one step, then another, a normal walking pace. However, she found herself on the other side of the room twice as quickly. She smiled, relieved. Cease, she commanded the shoes, and she prepared the rest of her spells, stowing them away in her purse alongside her pistol. She had only one round left. If only she had access to a forge. Smelters had spells for making a bullet hit its intended target, but such spells had to be crafted from molten metal, and there was no time for her to achieve such a feat. Not today. She slipped the rest of her materials and spells into her bag and took the servant stairs down to the main floor where she took the back exit out of the mansion. Enchanting her shoes to increase her speed tenfold, Sienny ran to the central London railway station in less than ten minutes, startling far more than ten passers-by on her way. Sienny stood outside a locked room in Aylesbury's council building, ear pressed to the door. The officer's words came through as only mumbles. No one was angry enough to shout bits of useful information to her. The clock on the wall across from her read 4.36. She had sought out the council building second, after the sheriff's office, and had seen several police officers exiting an automobile across the street, more than she would consider necessary for a town of Ellsbury's size. The London Police Department patch on one man's uniform had tipped her off. These were Magician Hughes's men, and now they sat behind this door discussing something important with an older man who C&E could only assume was with criminal affairs. She fished through her bag pulling out a tiny square mirror about twice the size of her thumbnail. Ensuring she had no witnesses, Sienny pinched her necklace, murmured her incantations, and became a gaffer. 
She then slid the mirror under the door near the jam, out of sight of those who gathered in the room, and walked away. Sienny didn't go far, just to the end of the hallway and around, where she found two chairs and a fern perched outside an office door paned with frosted glass. She sat and pulled out her ledger, trying her best to get some studying accomplished while the men in the room discussed affairs relating to her. She noticed a newspaper, still rolled, nestled against the door beside her. Read Education Board on the front in large blocked letters. She eyed the door. There was no electric lights on inside, just the gleam of the sun from an open window. An office of some sort, perhaps. Leaning over the armrest of her chair, Sienny grabbed the newspaper and unfolded it. The article in question read, Magician Cabinet Education Board Rules Against Opposite Sex Apprenticeships. The subtitle, Board Estimates the Disbanding of Over 100 Magician Apprenticeships. New ruling to take effect 14 September. Sienny blanched as she began to read the article. Oh, God, they've listed names. She skimmed first, searching the four-column article for any mention of Fane or Twill, but she found none. Releasing only half a breath, she read the brief summary of a magician Blair Peters, a gaffer, whose relationship with her apprentice had caused a nationwide scandal in Scotland last year. Her apprentice? Sienny whispered. She wondered at their ages, but the article didn't say, nor did it give the name of the apprentice. At least the newspaper had decided to only publicly humiliate one of the two. The writer also mentioned a magician Jumain Ibori, a smelter who had been accused of extramarital relations with his apprentice, though solid evidence had yet to be collected. Were these two scandals what caused the change? Or have there been others? She thought again about Emery. Zena. She read the article in its entirety. The new rule was being put into effect in time for the new school year at Tagus Prath, which would allow most apprentices to transfer at or near a year mark, and would supposedly make their transitions easier. September 14th. Only three months away. If Sienny didn't pass her magician's test, she'd certainly be transferred. Only for a short time, but the thought didn't comfort her. Shaking herself, Sienny rolled up the newspaper and dropped it in front of the door. She wondered if Emery had read today's paper yet, what he thought about the article. Two minutes short of an hour later, she heard the door down the hall open. Rising from her seat, Sienny peeked around the corner and watched six policemen and the older gentleman exit the room and head toward the front of the building. None of them spoke, save for a whispered exchange between two of the London officers. Sienny watched them go counted to twenty and then walked back down the hall. Checking for bystanders and finding none, she slipped into the room and found her mirror tile resting against the edge of a very old rug. She scooped it up and hurried outside, passing one of the officers on her way out, receiving nothing more than a glance. After all, there was more than one administrative office in the council building, and she could have come from any of them. Sienny hurried to a church down the street and staked out a quiet spot on an outdoor bench before enchanting the mirror in her hands. Reflect, past, she said. While the mirror's silvery surface showed her only the white ceiling, the officers' voices rang with adequate clarity. She listened as one man recounted the demise of Magician Cantrell, a story that made Sienny wince. She held on to every detail. She couldn't afford to miss anything. Another voice spoke of an Indian man arrested in Ellsbury two days ago, who turned out to be a businessman with a mere resemblance to the infamous excisioner. Then they brought up a story of a Mr. Cliff Prestonson, whose body had been found drained of blood in the passenger seat of his own automobile. His wallet and briefcase were missing, a bass voice explained. As far as we can tell, none of the banknotes have been used in Aylesbury. A tenor added, 
but the witness claims the attacker, matching Prindy's description, abandoned Prestonson's vehicle and tried two more before starting the engine of a Ford Model A. I presume Prindy couldn't find Prestonson's keys on his person. Wait, a witness? asked another tenor. It's in my report, sir, replied the man. She asked not to have her name disclosed, but she saw an Indian man follow Prestonson out of his vehicle and then grab him by the back of the neck. Prestonson reacted as though he'd been stabbed, though the witness saw no knife. The attacker pulled Prestonson into the passenger seat of the car and then emerged about a quarter of an hour later. He proceeded to steal the Ford, it belongs to an Ernest Hutchings, whose statement I have here, and take the highway toward Brackley. Brackley, Sienny thought with a shiver. Brackley sat northwest of London in Aylesbury. When? asked the second tenor. The base replied, Four o'clock this last night, sir. Sienny palmed the mirror and rose from the bench. Changing her allegiance to rubber, she enchanted her shoes and took off for Brackley. At the pace the sipping spell carried her, she imagined she'd reached the town before the officers did. Whether or not that was a good thing, she wasn't sure. The spell was exhilarating. Sienny's enchanted shoes turned the world into mosaics of color and sound as she whipped through it, taking the long way around towns to avoid running into anything substantial, though she did trip over a rabbit hole near Stratton oddly. Each step made her skin pull tight and her skirt fly behind her. Sienny held it down with either fist for the sake of modesty. Sienny wondered if such spells were the reason Magician Hughes had become a sipper. She arrived in good time. Brackley, northwest of Aylesbury, was a small town. As soon as Sienny arrived at the edge of a groomed park near a tree swing, she removed the spell from her shoes. The sun, though it hadn't set yet, had grown orange with age and made the town look more orange in turn. Beyond the park, Sienny passed a shop for bobbin lace and another for fabrics. A small grocery store and an inn sat on Bridge Street, where a few men in suspenders loaded some kind of animal feed onto a horse-drawn wagon. She continued past Marketplace, passing houses bricked in red and blue, an almshouse, and the Woodard Anglican School. Only one student graced its grounds at this hour. He sat on a bench reading a mathematics textbook. Sienny asked him if he'd seen any Indian men, especially one driving a Model A, but he hadn't. The sun drooped, encouraging Sienny to stick to the shadows. She wished she would have brought a hat with her to hide her hair. Surely its vibrant color would give her away to Siraj, though he wouldn't expect to see her in Brackley. The element of surprise was still hers. Her hands danced over the charms of her necklace, as she skirted by a small hospital. Scaffolding on its east side spoke of renovation. She peered down the next intersection, eyeing a row of apartments in a tall parish church the color of sandstone. A Ford Model A was parked across the street from it. Sienny stiffened and stepped beneath a brick alcove overhanging the door of a single-story library. Could this be Siraj's vehicle? The policeman hadn't mentioned the automobile's number. Perhaps she could check again in the glass. The sound of an engine caught her attention as a second Model A came around the corner. Or perhaps a Model C. The driver wore a top hat and an auburn mustache. His passenger, a woman in a frilly pink dress, laughed at some joke as they passed. Some clue you have, Sienny, she thought. Half the people in this town probably own a Ford. She lingered in the alcove a moment longer, watching the first automobile, until a young man exited the library with two books under his arm. He tipped his hat at her as he went, and Sienny stepped into the library. Passing a well-dressed gentleman reading the day's paper, she approached the librarian behind the desk and said, "'Excuse me, I'm looking for someone.' 
an Indian man, perhaps forty years old. Thin, tall. He dropped his wallet outside the hospital, and I didn't see which way he went. The librarian, an older woman with gray hair worn in Magician Avioski's favorite tight bun, shook her head. I think I'd remember. Sure he wasn't Spanish? Spanish? Mario lives on Bridge Street, she explained. He's from Madrid. Been here four years with his wife and little girl. I... Perhaps it was him, Sienny said, and tried to graciously accept the address the woman scribbled down on a scrap of paper. She tucked it under her collar and into her brassiere. Her skirt pockets were full with spells. As she walked through the streets of Brackley, Sienny's hand counted the spells in her bag and occasionally caressed the handle of her pistol. By the time she came full circle to the park, it was getting dark and her legs hurt. She chose a different route this time, one that took her by an old-looking spike. She saw some of the workhouse employees through lit windows, though none of them looked remotely like Siraj. A Ford drove by without its lights on, startling her. The driver was a middle-aged Caucasian male. She crossed the street and wound back through another residential street, stopping to ask a gardening woman about Siraj, but she had seen nothing either. As the evening darkened, Sienny became a pyre and held a match in her right hand just in case. She searched the houses carefully, thinking that Siraj might avoid busy streets if he wanted to stay out of sight. When the sun had sunk three-quarters of the way behind the horizon, she considered sending out birds to gather information for her, but didn't dare risk it. Crouching behind a whitewashed picket fence, Sienny pinched phosphorus and paper and became a folder. She pulled a long sheet of paper and rolled it between her hands, commanding it, Zoom! Eye to the telescope, she searched the area with what little light was left, even spied through a few windows. A man out walking his dog a few doors down eyed her with suspicion. Flushing, Sienny lowered the telescope and continued down the street and around the corner, emerging near the school. She searched with her telescope again, spying another empty Model T near the back of the school. She made a mental note of its location. Sienny's breath caught in her throat as she angled the telescope up a centimeter, pulling the back wall of the school into her scope. A sudden whirl of movement, a flash of black hair and the billowing of a dark coat caught her eye. But just as she registered what she was seeing, the man disappeared into one of the back doors. Lowering the telescope, she let it unfurl in her hands, breaking the enchantment. Her heart raced in her chest. The familiar prickle of fear stifled her skin, but she ignored it. Lyra. Graf. She had done this before. She could do it again. She was more prepared than anyone could be. One more pyre spell and it would all be over. She'd killed before. She could do it again, couldn't she? Her pulse, still fast, seemed to change its rhythm. It sounded, felt, unfamiliar to her, like she had stepped into the body of another person, moving their flesh as her own. Material made by earth, she whispered, pinching the wooden staff of one of the matches on her necklace as she moved toward the school. Your handler summons you. Unlink to me as I link through you, unto this very day. Material made by man, she continued, pressing her hand to her breast. I summon you. Link to me as I link to you, unto this very day. She lit the match and said, Material made by man, your creator summons you. Link to me as I link to you through my years, until the day I die and become earth. She closed her hand around the flame as she stepped onto the grassy lawn of the school. Heat radiated through her palm and arm, tingling, though not burning. She let the match drop from her fingers but kept its tiny flame in her palm. Siraj had left the door cracked open. She pulled its handle to open it wider, 
then stepped into a dark hallway lit in dim patches of shutterless windows. She stepped softly, balancing on the rubber pads still adhered to her soles. The narrow spaces between her fingers glowed red with the flame they concealed. She heard a footstep around the corner. The faintest creak of a shoe as the other foot stopped short. He was listening, waiting. He knew she was here. Sienny stepped up to the corner, pushed her shoulder into the brick, brought her fist up to her mouth and whispered, Flare! The footsteps started again and sped up, louder, louder, coming for her. Her body surged around the corner, flames bursting from her hand now, sending their golden brilliance down the hallway, illuminating her attacker and the burst spell flying from his hand. And in that light she saw him. His dark hair cropped short, his charcoal gray coat, the flames reflecting in his green eyes. Instead of yelling the combust command lingering at the edge of her tongue, Sienny stopped short and croaked, Emery?'